Good morning and welcome to Grand Medical Grand Round. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Molly Carnes, who is a professor of medicine, psychiatry, and industrial systems engineering at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, the other UW, or University of, uh, University of uh, W, Wisconsin, yeah. um, where she directs the Center for Women's Health Research in the School of Medicine and Public Health and co-directs the Women in Science and Engineering Leadership Institute wisely in the College of Engineering. Dr. Carnes received her undergraduate degree from the University of Michigan and her MD degree from the University of Buffalo. She completed an internal medicine uh, residency and geriatrics fellowship at the University of Wisconsin, where she also received a master's degree in epidemiology uh, in population health. She was the founding chief of the geriatric section at the William S. Middleton Memorial VA and continues at the VA as the founder and director of the VA Women's Health Program. Dr. Karn's research evaluates the influence of stereotypes on cognitive processing, treating them as habits, which allow, allows her to utilize behavioral change strategies to help faculty in medicine, science, and engineering break the bias habit. With support from the National Science Foundation and the NIH, Dr. Carnes has developed and tested interventions that have changed faculty behavior, improved department climate, and increased the hiring of female faculty and the retention of male faculty. Dr. Carnes has published over 150 papers, served two terms on the NIH advisory councils, and has received numerous awards for her research and her commitment to women's health and diversity issues. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Molly Carnes, whose medical grand rounds is entitled why is Jack more likely to become department chair than Jill? Thank you, Dr. Young. Uh, let's see. It is, it is really a thrill to be here at the other UW. Uh, we are the two UWs, so immediately we have something in common. Um, I'd first like to um, uh, put the required disclosure statement. I, I have no disclosures other than the fact that I am a woman in academic medicine. And I'd just like to briefly acknowledge those who've contributed to some of the research I'll be presenting as well as those who funded some of this research, including the National Science Foundation and the NIH. So also the required learning objectives. I followed all your guidelines about verbs to use. So by, by attending this lecture, one, given a letter of recommendation, one should be able to recognize gender stereotypic language that might unintentionally bias evaluation, identify a situation in which gender stereotypes might create advantages or disadvantages for men or women, respectively, and recite an example of a strategy that has been shown to help break the bias habit. So we'll start with some data, right? If we look at women, there is no doubt that since Title IX, the Education Amendment of the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1972, making it illegal to discriminate against women entering uh, any kind of educational organization that took federal dollars, which is almost all of them. No doubt that at the early pipeline stages, there has been tremendous progress in opening essentially all fields of science, engineering, medicine to women. So these are uh, data from the AAMC for internal medicine. Um, well, first of all, at the medical student level, there's been gender parity for a decade or so. If we look at internal medicine residents, about 40% of our residents have been women also for several decades. And I think we can take some professional pride in the fact that we don't see a reduction in the percentage of women going from residency to junior faculty, assistant professors. But then, as in every single field, there is a disproportionate loss of women at every subsequent career stage. And no matter how you model it, it is a disproportionate loss. So we're going to focus on women, we're going to focus on gender issues, but I do want to point out that if we look at other groups, so if we look at um, groups identified as uh, historically underrepresented ethnic and racial minority groups in our country, we, we have ways to go even at early pipeline stages before we reach um, the percentage of uh, uh, individuals who identify in one of these groups in the U.S. population. And if we look at well-represented minorities, so this is primarily people 
who identify in one of the multiple subgroups currently subsumed under the term Asian. So we see well representation at the early pipeline stages in medicine. Again, this is internal medicine, but almost every field of medicine would look like this. But as with women, we see a disproportionate loss uh, as we get uh, at subsequent career stages, particularly at higher levels of leadership. So the first question to ask, do we care? You know, is academic medicine thriving to the extent that it doesn't really matter if we have people at leadership levels from um, these underrepresented groups? And again, we're focusing on gender. So does it matter if we're losing women from leadership positions? And again, focusing on issues for women, we have only to look at the case of women's health across the history of our country to realize that we need to care quite a lot because almost every major advance in women's health in our country can be linked to women academic leaders. So for example, if you look in the post-Civil War era, so women academic leaders at that time were white women with a college education. And these women were convening in their homes physiologic societies. And they were advocating for healthful practices for women. And I think many of us in the audience are very grateful that they successfully advocated to abandon the corset as a fashion statement. So think how much more difficult it would be to do all you have to do in a day if you could not breathe or eat. So in more contemporary times, we can look at the Women's Health Initiative. Uh, at the time, Women's Health Initiative was launched. It was the largest multi-site randomized controlled clinical trial ever done, 165,000 women. And one of the issues that, actually the major issue it was set to uh, examine was whether treating postmenopausal women with a combination of estrogen and progesterone would reduce the incidence of cardiovascular events. And um, turned out it, it didn't. It actually increased the incidence of cardiovascular events. And after the major uh, results of the study were published in JAMA, prescriptions largely by internists, for uh, postmenopausal uh, hormonal replacement therapy, the prescriptions for that plummeted to like 75% down within two years, um, probably saving the lives of many women, maybe thousands of women. So the relevant point here is that the Women's Health Initiative would never have been launched had Bernadine Healy not been the first and so far the only woman director of NIH. She advocated very strongly for that study. Okay, so maybe there's something about leadership. You know, as you go up academic career stages, you have to take on more and more leadership responsibilities. Maybe there's something about the way women are socialized. Maybe there's biology involved. Maybe there's something about women that makes them less effective leaders than their male counterparts. So we're steeped in the value of evidence. There is an enormous research body on leadership. And if you look at this research, it is clear that the most effective leaders across domains, whether it's the military or academics or industry, education, the most effective leaders are those who lead with what is called a transformational leadership style. And these transformational leaders are leaders who are able to inspire members of an organization to invest time and energy in the organization beyond their own self-interest, right? These are the people that give that discretionary effort to the organization. So if you're talking about academic medicine, academic science, you are talking about an organization that is full of highly trained, highly skilled, highly, very expensive individuals, right? So if you are a leader who is able to get those people to invest that discretionary effort in your organization, you are an enormously valuable leader. So is there any research on gender differences in transformational leadership? So again, we can look at research on leadership. Uh, one of the pioneers in this field of research is Alice Egley, who is a social psychologist uh, so social psychologist at Northwestern, and she has spent essentially her entire academic career studying 
uh, Gender Issues and Leadership. She's written books, she's written in the Harvard Business Review. And a few years ago, she did a meta-analysis of 45 studies that looked at leadership effectiveness to see if there was a difference by gender, and, and no difference. I mean, the effect sizes were minuscule. But when there were significant differences, women were significantly more likely to lead with a transformational leadership style than were men. So if you follow my line of reasoning, if we're doing something, however unintentionally, that is systematically causing women to drop out of academic science and medicine, and even if there's a chance that they're going to be transformational leaders, we are really not doing what is best for the future of academic science and medicine. All right, so why is this happening? Title IX, 1972, all, all this evidence that it would be good to have more women leaders, and it can come back to work um, uh, in the area of prejudice, much of which has actually come from the University of Washington, where you have Anthony Greenwald and many of his graduate students and postdocs. Cheryl Kaiser is your chair of psychology. So actually much of this research has come from the University of Washington. But it, it comes to the fact that there are um, assumptions about groups of people lead to two kinds of intergroup bias. So one is the explicit, consciously endorsed personal beliefs you may hold about groups of people. And these are generally measured in surveys, right? You're, you're asked a question in a survey, you can think about what you believe, you can explicitly put your answer. And if you look at these national surveys, um, like the General Social Survey, you would conclude that over the last, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, these kinds of explicit prejudices in our country are decreasing. I mean, clearly not gone. All you have to do is pick up the newspaper, but decreasing. So whether it's gender bias, race bias, same-sex bias, religious bias, these kinds of biases are decreasing. But what really hasn't decreased are these more implicit, unconscious processes that are based merely on the fact that cultural stereotypes about groups of people exist, and we know them. Whether we believe them or not, we know them. And these kinds of biases are still highly prevalent. And I'm sure at this point in time, particularly at the University of Washington, you have all taken an implicit association test. Am I right? Right, okay, I see lots of heads nodding, but for the few who weren't nodding, this was actually developed by Anthony Greenwald. Um, but if you um, go to the Harvard Project Implicit website, you can just Google IAT, which stands for Implicit Association Test, and you can test for your own kinds of implicit biases, which basically tells you how strongly you link certain traits or behaviors to one social group or another. And there's all kinds of these uh, IATs. I encourage you to go and take some, but basically for those of you who haven't taken it, the way they work on your computer screen, you are shown words or pictures that either align with or, or do not align with cultural stereotypes. And you're asked to sort them as quickly as possible by pushing computer keys. And it turns out the vast majority of us are more quick when we are matching stereotype congruent words or pictures than when we are measuring, or than we're matching stereotype incongruent. And it's a difference in milliseconds there that tells you how strongly you link certain traits or behaviors. And, you know, full disclosure, I should have put this in the beginning, I have every bias in the book, <laughs> every single stereotype based bias, except for aging, which, and I'm a geriatrician, so I was actually pleased to see that. <laughs> All the others I have, uh, including women in science. So if this was just a little sort of game on computer keys, it would be interesting, but maybe it wouldn't be consequential, but it turns out in many instances, it's not the predictor of behavior that social psychologists originally thought, but in randomized controlled experiments, you can show that under certain conditions and in certain instances, even among physicians, these kinds of implicit biases actually are strong predictors of our behavior. And what's particularly important, they can predict our behavior even when these implicit biases are at odds with our explicit egalitarian beliefs. But the good news is our research and others shows that these cognitive processes function as habits. And we know habits can be broken. 
All right, so let's talk a little bit about these habits or habits of mind, if you will. So habits of mind usually serve us very well, right? We know as physicians, we can take partial information with pattern recognition. You know, all we need is like an infiltrate and a fever and boom, you know, we've got pneumonia. So they, they usually serve us quite well. But they can lead to errors and they can interfere with our conscious intention. And so to illustrate that to you, I'm just going to start with a little optical illusion. There's a website with hundreds of these, but this is a picture of tables. Do the tops of these tables appear to be the, so the same size and shape to anyone? No, I've been looking at this for years now. They, they don't, right? One appears thin, one appears wider. But I'm just going to highlight with PowerPoint this table and move it over and spin it around to show you that they're the same size and shape. But I'm sure that convinces nobody, right? You think I've, I've done some clever thing with PowerPoint. But I have not. And to prove that to you, let's see, I've got my little, I've got these very high tech, I know I'm in the world of high tech here. And you're gonna laugh because I am going to show you overheads. Does anybody remember teaching with overhead? Probably not. Oh, good. Thank you. Okay, a few actually know what these are. All right, so I have this, and I'm going to do the exact same thing here. I'm going to just move this tabletop over. Okay, and some of you may not be able to see that. So to really prove to you that this is the case, I have a few copies. I want these back at the end, but you can pass these around and do your own your own tabletop flip at your leisure during the talk. Just convince that the other UW is not trying to put one over on you. <laughs> All right. Here you go. Just pass those around. Okay. And I'll just select them at the end. All right. So habits of mind can be subject to error. You have a lifetime of experience with real tabletops in a real three-dimensional world. And um, that would tell you that tables like this seen in a three-dimensional world would not be the same size and shape. And that could be very useful, you know, if you're trying to move one through a door, if you're setting up for a dinner party. But that same habit of mind that allows you to correctly interpret these tabletops in a three-dimensional world makes it impossible for you to correctly interpret these tabletops in a two-dimensional portrayal. So habits of mind can be subject to error. Okay, what about failing your conscious intentions? Because what we're really interested in is the behavioral manifestations of these implicit biases. So to demonstrate to you how these habits of mind can be um, to, can interfere with your conscious intentions, I'm going to use the Stroop color naming task. So this has been around since the 1930s. Um, and it's going to require a little audience participation. So I'm going to put up very quickly a series of words, and I want you to ignore what the word says. Ignore the content of the word and call out as quickly and loudly as you can the color of ink in which the word is written. Okay, ignore what the word says, call out the color of ink, on your mark, get set, go. Okay, great. <laughs> awesome. All right. Trivially easy, right? Okay, but you know where I'm going, and even though you know where I'm going, it's still not going to work. <laughs> okay, so now I am giving you the exact same instructions. I want you to ignore what the word says and call out as quickly and loudly as you can the color of ink in which the word is written. Okay, on your mark, get set, go. Blue, green, red, yellow, black, brown. Okay. All right. Point made. Could you feel the interference, right? Because at this point in your life, reading English is a habit of mine. And that's a good thing, right? You have to read electronic health records, you got to read signs along the highway. It is a very quick automatic process. But you can see that that same kind of habit of mind that is so often useful failed your intention 
to ignore what the word says and call out the color of ink. And that same kind of interference that occurs um, in this group color naming task can also occur when we are interacting with people in a social world. These habits of mind that you can demonstrate on an implicit association test that you have can be called into play very quickly and interfere with your conscious intentions and distort information as in the um, tabletop example. All right, so now let's move to stereotypes about people. Let's move into the social world. Again, we're focusing on gender. And even though we know explicitly gender is not a binary, right? It exists along a nuanced continuum. Living in this society, you know the content of stereotypes about men and women as a binary. And just to prove that to you, I'm going to ask you to call it whether you believe them or not. What are some common stereotypes about men? Just call one out. Decisive. Decisive. Okay, what was the one over here? Strong. Strong. Decisive. One more. Irrational. Irrational? <laughs> Actually, logical is usually. <laughs> um, but these stereotypes resist disconfirming data. So even if you say irrational, people still know that the stereotype comes with logical and rational. Um, somebody usually says, doesn't stop and ask for directions, <laughs> okay? And that is exactly what happens, people laugh. And we know humor only works if there's shared knowledge. So the fact that that was funny to you shows that you know that that is part of a content of a male gendered stereotype in our society. So things like decisive, authoritative, strong, assertive, logical, independent, Studies have been done over and over again where essentially people do just what I did to you. People are asked to just off the top of their head list stereotypes about men and these kinds of things come up. And generally, uh, these are subsumed under the term agentic. They, they require human agency. Um, they are action oriented, a sort of independent action. Agentic traits and behaviors in our society are more strongly stereotypically linked to men. Okay, well, what about women? Again, whether you believe them or not, what are some common stereotypes about women? Call one out. What was it? Emotional? Did you say? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but again, you know, this is the interesting thing. Stereotypes resist even proof. Because we tend to pay attention, because we know the stereotypes, we tend to pay attention to information in evaluating an individual from that stereotype group that reinforces the stereotype, and we selectively ignore disconfirming information, just as we do in a clinical setting, you know, with like confirmation bias, right? You think it's pneumonia, so every piece of clinical data that would reinforce pneumonia, you pay attention to, and you ignore all the stuff that would make it a pulmonary embolism. Um, but smart, I'll take it. <laughs> okay, emotional, smart. One, one more. Collaborative. Nurturing, okay, so again, it shows you can call these out fairly easily. We know, I may have missed a few, but we, we know the content of stereotypes, whether we believe them or not, right? And again, uh, groups of people come up with things like you did, nurturing, gentle, supportive, good at relationships, emotional, dependent. And the stereotypes for women are generally subsumed under the term communal. So agentic, action-oriented, traits and behaviors more stereotypically linked to men communal behaviors more stereotypically linked to women. Well, it turns out we also have assumptions about what kinds of traits and behaviors are required to succeed in certain roles. And if we look at roles in academic medicine, leaders, scientists, um, we can see that the assumptions of what one would need to succeed much more align with the agentic assumptions about men, decides of authoritative, strong, assertive, than they do with the communal assumptions about women. Now, here is another example of stereotypes resisting disconfirming data, because if you actually look at the traits and behaviors of transformational leaders, they actually include lots of communal behaviors, right? Transformational leaders care about members of their organization. They, they mentor people. They create warm and collaborative working environments, and yet, Again, study after study, off the top of your head, if you ask people what characteri characterizes a leader, 
they will come up with very agentic traits. All right, so these are some data from um, Anthony Greenwald, who's here at University of Washington, and uh, some of his former trainees from that Harvard Project Implicit website, looking at uh, implicit bias related to science and gender. And so in this particular implicit association test, people are shown male gendered words like he, she, aunt, uncle, and words associated with science, like chemistry, genetics, and again, asked to sort them very quickly. And it turns out the 70%, that's the blue lines, of both men and women much more quickly match the male gendered terms and the science words and the female gendered terms and the liberal arts words like history and um, English. Again, same for men and women. Um, just proving, again, that the stronger link for science and male gender. And then these are data from the University of Wisconsin. We gave an implicit association test. It had male or female gendered names and words associated with leader or supporter. And we found that 70% of both our male and female faculty more quickly matched the leader words and the male names and the female uh, names and the supporter words. So leader, male names, supporter, female names. And even though we have an enormously popular woman chancellor, and I'm sure if you actually asked our faculty explicitly, do they think women can't be as good leaders as men, they would laugh in your face. All right, so how does all this differentially impact Jack or Jill? So when Jill is being evaluated in a male-typed role, so this is one of these roles where we assume agentic traits or behaviors are needed for success, it creates this lack of fit, or what's been called role incongruity for Jill, because of this implicit assumption that she's communal and this assumption that agentic traits are needed. And Monica Bernard at University of Kansas has done a lot of work showing that this sort of lack of fit leads to an implicit assumption that Jill will be less competent than Jack. She's not afforded this role congruity. And so in study after study, Jill has to provide evaluators with a higher level of proof of her competence. So no matter what the coin of the realm is, if it's billable hours, or I guess it would be patients seen or grants written or dollars brought in, women would, Jill would have to provide a higher level of proof to be viewed as comparably competent to Jack. Well, you might say, oh, come on, Jill, just man up. Just act like Jack, you'll be fine. What was Title IX about? Now you have the opportunity to act like Jack. Well, it turns out this would be very bad advice um, because experimental studies show that if Jill acts too agentically, she is penalized in evaluation. Um, and if you can think of a very agentic Jill and the words that might be leveled at her, you can see that those would not be useful in a performance evaluation. Okay, so let's think about medicine overall. And I should mention too that there is a tight conflation of gender and status. So in our society, men and things associated with male are imbued with higher status than women and things associated with female. Just like white skin is imbued with higher status than skins of color. So if you look overall at specialties of medicine, um, the most agentic specialties, if you will, neurosurgery, orthopedics, urology, the, the lowest percent women, but it's interesting that as women enter these fields, they're sort of subtly um, settled or subtly uh, find themselves in the more communal role, right? So rather than research, they're relatively overrepresented in teaching and education, overrepresented in service. Now, if you look at our um, communal specialty, right? So pediatrics, 50% women going into pediatrics since 1980. So pediatrics, family medicine, primary care, internal medicine, lots and lots of women, over 50% women. But men in these fields are overrepresented in the, in the agentic roles. So 50% women in pediatrics since 1980, 15% of pediatric chairs are women. Now internal medicine is interesting because we're so big, right? We are 25% of all physicians. And we have the whole spectrum of agentic 
and communal. So if you look at our, our more, I guess you would say communal subspecialties, geriatrics, general thermal medicine, endocrine for some reason. Um, endocrine, 70% of the trainees going into endocrinology are women, 70%. 9% in interventional cardiology. So I find this fascinating because all of the residents are in the same place in the same time for three years, right? What do we do to them during that time that launches them on these career trajectories that rise up in some of the most dramatic occupational sex segregation you will see in any field? Now, Salary is often a, a measure for status. And if you, I just went to Medscape and looked at the average salaries. And if you look at the average salary, the correlation between the percent women in a subspecialty and the average salary, just I ran a simple correlation, R is 0.9. Wouldn't you long to have that in your own research? <laughs> so there is quite a tight correlation between salary status and the percent of women in our various subspecialties within internal medicine. All right, so I've become, um, again, fascinated in what happens at kind of critical career juncture, junctures that winds up with this dramatic occupational sex segregation in medicine overall and within internal medicine. So a few years ago, I had an opportunity to um, evaluate um, the, med the medical student performance evaluations, the aggregate dean's letters that are written for medical students. And these were medical students applying for a competitive diagnostic radiology residency at Dartmouth. Um, and I've become interested in analyzing the written test that evaluators write at these critical junctures as sort of a window into their decision making. And we, we analyzed the heck out of the text of these um, uh, MSPEs. And I'm just gonna show you one little piece of this analysis because it sheds some light on the data on the previous slides. So, in the factor analysis of the text, of the categories of words that were in these texts, only female students with female authors had family medicine for communal specialty correlating with standout adjectives. So words like excellent, outstanding, um, exceptional. Male students with male authors, family medicine was mentioned so rarely it didn't load significantly on the factors. And Female authors writing about male students, family medicine negatively correlated with words in the ability and insight category. So we saw these subtle differences and we're like, what does this mean? So we went back in the text to sort of qualitatively look at how were the letter writers using these words. And so, for example, um, a female author writing about a male student wrote, he really surprised us. He is exceptional, an exceptional student in family medicine. Right, so now that you know about role congruity and these stereotype assumptions, you can see where that little element of surprise comes from, right? Because he, with this implicit assumption that he's agentic, family medicine, this implicit assumption that it's a communal specialty, what a surprise, he's an exceptional student. Um, another one wrote, although he received highest honors on his family medicine rotation, surely his finest performance was on surgery. That you can sort of feel the cognitive relief. This is a better fit. He was good in family medicine, but he was good in surgery. And she went on to write. He was outstanding. He spoke with families. He got consent form signed, and he was extremely aggressive. <laughs> yeah, I can pretty much guarantee you these are descriptors that would not help Jill in getting into that residency. All right. Also, think about it. If, if people are writing this, okay, Probably the students are being bombarded with subtle messages every day that would sort of socialize women toward more communal specialties and men toward more agentic specialties, right? And again, thinking about how we tend to selectively attend to stereotype reinforcing information, right? So you see a female medical student interacting with families and you say, you know, you are so good at interacting with families. Have you thought about pediatrics, you thought about general trauma medicine, you may just not see that same behavior in a male student, but when the male student does an awesome LP, right, you might say, you are so technically skilled. Have you thought about interventional cardiology? 
you know, without intending to do it, this is just the way the human mind works in processing information. All right. So how might these kind of stereotype assumptions work against Jill herself? Um, Lori Rudman at Rutgers has written a lot about what she terms fear of backlash. So girls and boys learn at a very early age what the boundaries of behavior are based on these stereotyped assumptions. And so girls are admonished at an early age, you know, don't be too loud, be modest, don't brag. And Redman says they internalize these boundaries and it creates this fear of backlash, this fear of, of breaching these, um, these borders for gendered behavior. And we were interested to see whether um, female internal medicine residents would experience this fear of backlash when they were forced to behave in, a, in an agentic way like leading cardiopulmonary resuscitative events. Because I'm sure at University of Washington, just like at University of Wisconsin, at night uh, it is the on-call resident who leads the code. And probably 40% of your residents are women, uh, which is the national average. So we did a qualitative study interviewing medical residents from nine programs around the country. Good news is nobody perceived any influence of gender on the effectiveness of a resident to lead a code. And as we surmised, the ideal code leader was consistently described in highly agentic terms. No transformational leaders in a code, right? <laughs> the ideal code leader was described as being assertive, having an authoritative presence, having a loud, deep voice, being tall, controlling the room. Um, and as we surmise, the, the need to behave in this counter-normative way was very stressful for many of the women residents. They, they did indeed express this fear of backlash. So one said, I, I just felt kind of bad yelling at people. I always turn red. I just try to do my best to look authoritative, but it's stressful. You aren't sure if people's feelings are going to be hurt or if they're going to be mad about it. One said the most important thing, okay, right, we're in a code. The resident is trying to bring someone back to life. But the most important thing is that when I ask for things, they should not sound like orders. Okay, clearly fear of backlash. The good news is the female residents on their own had found strategies, very effective strategies, to help them integrate these conflicting identities of being socialized to be a woman in our culture and having to lead in this essentially masculine way, in this highly agentic way. So they clearly were giving themselves permission to suspend gender norms during a code. Um, they said things like, that is not a very accepted way to speak to people outside of a code, but I think in that room it's fine. Or normally, I'm very much, would you please mind putting in a line? In a code, it's a different situation. Totally, I just dropped the pleasantries and, her, and formalities. And one woman said she was able to be directive in a code because afterwards, she was always super apologetic. It worked for her. Um, some found the importance of affirming their legitimate power in the situation. So wearing the long white coat, having a badge that said resident, announcing they're carrying the code pager. And some talked about physically the importance of adopting a code persona or a code stance. Uh, one said, I tend to stand at the foot of the bed or have my hands on the foot of the bed and then just sort of lean over a patient a little bit. It makes me feel like I am more in control of the situation. And that's interesting because there is a large body of research on, it's called embodied cognition. And in some of the studies, they have participants assume a powerful stance or a submissive stance. And assuming that powerful stance makes people feel more powerful. And this is one of the powerful stances. How is that not the code stance described <laughs> by our residents? So we thought this research had a lot of implications for resident training. First, it's important to clearly affirm that research finds ours and others finds no difference in the effectiveness of male and female physicians to be effective in any relevant role in residency or throughout medicine. Discuss some of the research on gender norms and implicit bias and present some strategies to mitigate 
of the potential impact of these stereotypes on resident experiences so that the resident doesn't feel it's their own personal fault. Okay, so now let's come back to breaking the bias habit. We all know, particularly as physicians, but everybody knows that breaking any behavioral habit requires more than simply good intentions. It is a multi-step process. It requires awareness. It requires motivation, right? We try to get our patients to stop smoking. It requires effort, it requires self-efficacy. They must feel confident in engaging in a new behavior with some positive outcome expectations, to use Bandura's terms. And importantly, they must deliberately practice the new behavior until it becomes habitual. So um, with an R01, we had the opportunity to develop a bias habit reducing workshop and um, we did a cluster randomized trial. This was in a gender context because that's what the RFA specified. So this was breaking the gender bias habit. We used 92 STEM departments. So science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine. Um, we used uh, departments or units that functioned like departments. So every division in the Department of Medicine uh, was considered a department. And then we randomly allocated 46 of these departmental units to receive the workshop and 46 to remain as control with over a thousand faculty in each group. And then at baseline, three days after the workshop and three months after the workshop, we had some online surveys that assessed those various stages of change mentioned in the last slide. So there are many pieces of the workshop, but one important part of it is we gave faculty specific behavioral strategies, cognitive behavioral strategies they could practice um, to help break the bias habits, each one uh, resulting from at least one randomized experimental study. So stereotype replacement, and none of these are really hard, but practicing stereotype replacement. If you see a stereotype portrayed, if you find yourself thinking in a stereotype way, Call it a stereotype, replace that, challenge it, and replace it with real data. Counter stereotypic imaging, this comes from the work of Irene Blair at University of Colorado, particularly in an evaluation setting. Imagine in detail a positive counter stereotype exemplar, right? Think about an effective woman leader. Think about an African American scientist. Individuating rather than generalizing, practice getting individual information about people rather than generalizing from a group stereotype. Perspective taking, metaphorically putting yourselves in the shoes of another person from a different social group, and increasing opportunities for high value contact. We also uh, told participants about strategies where research shows these don't work. So one is stereotype suppression. You know, I'm genderblind, I'm colorblind, I treat everybody like a human being, that doesn't work. Um, turns out that actually increases susceptibility to stereotyping. It's far better to think we're all different and it's a good thing. And then having too strong a belief in one's personal objectivity. So you can show experimentally that the people who tell you they have no bias will indeed give the most biased evaluation. So then we found these mixed linear effects models. We found um, at three days and three months that faculty allocated to the experimental group were significantly more likely to be aware of their own personal biases, to be motivated to engage in bias habit reducing activities, to feel confident that they could do so and that they were doing so on a regular basis. And notice there was no significant change in the implicit association test, that leadership implicit association test. And that's so important. The goal here is not to change your scores on those IATs. Those links are constantly being reinforced in society. This shows you can change your behavior even if you have those kinds of implicit biases that can be measured with something like the IAT. You can overcome them. Okay, well, you might say, all right, Molly, this may be statistically significant, but on a Likert scale, those look pretty tiny. Is there any clinical significance? So we're fortunate at the University of Wisconsin that Dr. Sheridan, my colleague, leads the study of faculty work life. And this is a postal survey that goes to all faculty at University of Wisconsin. And we timed it so that they would get a wave of the survey before 
any of the participating departments had their workshop, and then after all 46 had received their workshop. And we pulled out the 92 participating units, and we pulled out the questions that get at the perception of department climate. So climate is the term we use to assess one's work environment. And we found that both male and female faculty in the departments allocated to the experimental group were significantly more likely to say they fit in their department. So blue is the control, red is the experimental. They fit in their department. They, fect, they felt respected by their colleagues for their research and scholarship. And they felt comfortable raising personal obligations, even if it conflicted with departmental activities. And we think that is very important, particularly given concern about burnout. burnout. The largest group of faculty in our study were from the medical school. All right, so we were able, for odd reasons related to our IRB, the control group remained a control group because we were running out of time and money and we had to give our workshops to the control group at the school and college level rather than the department level, which is interesting in and of itself. But fewer than 2% of the faculty showed at the school or college level, so they remained controlled. So three years later, we were able to go back and look at hiring outcomes. So these are hard institutional outcomes of this intervention to invoke individual behavioral change. So the blue lines are two years before the study. The red lines are two years after the study. Um, the first group of four bars there are the percent women among new faculty hires. So no change in the control department. It remained at 32%. In the experimental departments, it's basically parity. About half the new hires were women, half the new hires were men. And although the um, study focused on gender bias, we also saw differences in um, hiring of um, non-white faculty. So this is basically underrepresented and well-represented minorities, a slight increase in the experimental groups, actually a drop in the control groups, and the same thing um, with underrepresented minority faculty. Now these were not statistically significant, but because we included all STEM departments at the University of Wisconsin, these are real findings. So this is like eight new, facts, eight new underrepresented minority faculty at the University of Wisconsin. All right, so summary and conclusions. Gender stereotypes affect our attitudes, behaviors, and judgments even when we don't want them to and even when we are unaware of them. These group stereotypes have real effects on individual women in traditionally male fields, particularly as they rise toward leadership or make decisions about medical specialties. The bias habit can be broken, uh, but it takes more than good intention. But when STEM faculty at one institution broke the gender bias habit, department climate improved for everyone, more women faculty were hired, and I forgot to mention significantly more male faculty were retained in the experimental department. So what are future directions? We want to see whether this breaking the bias habit approach, this motivated self-regulation of bias works beyond just one institution and beyond just gender bias. So with funding from an NIH R35, we have launched the BRIM study, Bias Reduction Internal Medicine Initiative. Um, it is a cluster randomized trial of a workshop that addresses bias beyond gender. The BRIM workshop looks at gender, race, religion, BMI, LGBT. There are 20 departments of medicine involved, and it's a two-year collaboration with each site. And we've included an implementation science piece, too, because we want to build capacity at each of the 20 participating sites so that at the end of the two-year collaboration, you have a team of people who can de deliver this workshop you can continue to study this kind of, of strategy, and you can slice and dice the workshop however you want. Um, these are the 20 sites participating, and we are delighted that University of Washington is one of them. We are here today actually as the launch visit for the BRIM study. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions. When you're talking tra to trainees about how we've socialized gender norms, how do you not cause damage but with stereotype threats? 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a very good question. So for those of you who are not familiar with stereotype threat, it turns out, and this work comes from Claude Steele um, uh, at Stanford, and, and it's been around now, this, this concept is around, I think, for like 20 years now. But if, if you are a member of a group that has negative performance as part of that group stereotype, like women in math, uh, blacks in terms of academic achievement, if something happens that reminds you that you are a member of that group, it can actually negatively perform, it negatively affect your performance um, relative to your own abilities. And, and this can be shown experimentally over and over again. You know, if, if, if girls have to identify their gender at the top of the math test, they'll do worse than if they have to identify their gender at the bottom of the math test. They'll do worse than comparable males with the same training. So it's been shown over and over again. So the question relates to if you tell women about these gender stereotypes, do you risk um, triggering stereotype threat? But it turns out one of the effective interventions to mitigate the impact of stereotype threat is to tell people about it. So in one of Claude Steele's interventions related to math performance, he just said, you know, if you feel anxious during this test and you're a woman, it's because this exists, but, you know, don't worry about it. If you've done the homework and you've you know, taken the courses, it has nothing to do with you. And so I would say actually telling people about these gendered stereotypes kind of neutralizes their impact. Like, it's not my fault. There's centuries of stereotypes related to gender or race or whatever that leads to these kinds of biases. It's not me. To what extent uh, does implicit or explicit gender bias vary by the age of the respondent? You know, it, there's like an echo. I can't, could someone repeat that question? I can't, I can't hear it. To what extent does age or gender bias seem to vary by the age of the respondent? Oh, great question. To what extent does gender or race or every, any kind of bias uh, vary by the age of the respondent? So, you know, we would hope that the younger generations are getting better, right? We would so hope that. Uh, maybe with LGBT bias, we're seeing a reduction in that. But um, these kinds of gender biases, I mean, all you have to do is look at um, pictures of who's leading the country every day in the news or whatever you, wherever you access your news. And it reinforces that, you know, white men in suits and ties are leaders. Even if you explicitly might not think they're the best leaders, it nevertheless reinforces that. So we are just, you know, the human mind is so good at accessing information. That's why we're at the top of the food chain. And so even if we don't want to access these kinds of reinforcing information related to race or gender, it's there. So these implicit processes, social psychologists have done versions of the IAT for race in four-year-olds, and the biases are already there. So you had a nice model for individual change and progression of individual change. What about institutional change, where there's institutional uh, policies or procedures that are actually biased or discriminatory? Is it the same model? So the question relates to, we're focusing on the individuals, why not focus on institutional change? So again, I'm a, I'm a systems engineer. <laughs> I'm in the Department of Systems Engineering. And any kind of cultural change requires multi-level interventions, and that's why we use smoking as our metaphor because nobody can doubt that there has been a cultural change around smoking. So some of you may be of my generation and can remember when the professors actually smoked in the medical school classroom. And the younger people would just find that appalling. I mean, when I was an intern, nurses would leave lit cigarettes and little glass ashtrays in a room next to the intensive care unit. Right? I mean, and that is just unfathomable with younger people. That is a cultural change. But what had to happen to make that, ha that, to, to make that cultural change? First, you had to get enough individual people to stop smoking, right? And to find that being around smokers was bad for their health and not pleasant. And then they advocated for policy change. And then the policy change accelerated things. But to get the system changed, you had to have interventions at multiple levels, but to get the policy interventions, 
you had to get the individual change. And if you look at research and organizational change, you have to change the attitudes and behaviors of the individuals who establish the culture and maintain the status quo in an organization, which in academic uh, environments are the faculty. So that's why we have particularly focused on faculty. Can you hear me? Um, obviously, you're very successful at doing this kind of work, and I'm just curious, before you got to this point, um, obviously when you were earlier in your career, um, you may have been at risk for this type of stereotype threat doing this kind of research. Um, and I'm just curious, what kind of elements do you think you had in your own environment that allowed you to be successful and build off your early work to get to the point that you can have this amazing multi-institutional study? Wow. Um, so the question relates to what, what in my own life, um, you know, I, I, it turns out I love to build programs. I didn't even know that about myself. But um, when I was a resident, geriatrics was a very new field. And, you know, now that I know the research, and I look back and I think, well, maybe it was one of the only fields open to women. I mean, um, there actually at the time I was in a resident, there were no women um, fellows in any of the subspecialties. Geriatrics was open. Nobody wanted it. So, I, you know, as a fellow, I started writing grants. So writing grants was a very useful skill to get at an early age. And I found if you bring in your own resources, the institution may not welcome you, but they will make room for you if you're bringing in money. <laughs> and then I strategically, I strategically framed um, research on gender, women in science, um, women's health, linking um, women academic career advancement to women's health. I framed it in ways that the system valued, right? So one of NIH funding, right? Getting NIH grants. Um, getting a name professorship didn't hurt, um, and then um, getting a center, right? So people, we have Center for Women's Health Research, we have Women in Science and Engineering Leadership Institute. So everybody got at UW-Madison, University of Wisconsin-Madison, <laughs> um, that a center is high status, right? And they're like, women, that's low status, right? But if you could do all the other stuff, if you could publish, now it was harder to get published, and we had really some reviewers that just raked us over the coals, right? Um, I, uh, but, you know, I'm not a, um, I could see the opportunities, right? So, yeah, for, there were maybe barriers being women in academic medicine trying to advance a field that wasn't kind of traditional, but I was a woman in academic medicine. I had tenure. So I was in a position where I could really help change the institution in ways that I saw would benefit the institution. I just had to frame the argument in ways that allowed them to see it wasn't about me, it was about making them better. And then try to do it with, with framing things that were of value. Thank you for your talk this morning. I, I have to admit, I learned a lot. And, oh, thank and, you. Uh, I'm, uh, happy that University of Washington is a BRIM site and hope that you'll consider uh, BRIS in the future, uh, bias reduction in surgery. Uh, so, um, <laughs> I don't know if that acronym would work quite as well. <laughs> I mean, some of the men might do. <laughs> it's not an accident. <laughs> um, so I, I was interested in the part where you're talking about variations in evaluations of, of students or residents. In surgery, we, we have a hypothesis in our department that there's a systematic bias in the way that female residents and male residents are evaluated on their rotations mm -hmm. um, that we're, we're heading into a study on to with a view, the hypothesis being that male residents have more performance-based adjectives and terms, mm -hmm. and female residents have more behavior-based mm -hmm. uh, um, terms. Mm -hmm. is, is there other work in this that, that's a good reference point for us to, to work on as I'm kind of advising our group that's looking at that? We're trying to look at several years of evaluations and and see what kind of system, systemic or systematic bias we think that there may exist just in the evaluation of our residents. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly a, a large body of experimental research would, would suggest that 
when women are evaluated in these male type fields, it, it's going to influence the way they're evaluated. Probably the most relevant research, there's a couple of papers that have come out looking at male and female emergency medicine residents and found difference in evaluation. Um, and there's certainly quite a few studies looking at letters of recommendation. So if you look at letters of recommendation, um, actually one of the first studies was Trix and Senka and it was done in a medical school. And they looked at letters for faculty who had been successfully hired um, and looked to see if there were difference between the letters written for men and women. So it's important to remember they were successfully hired. So it's hard to know if these differences were advantageous or not. I mean, it might be advantageous for your women to have these relational terms. But anyway, they found just what you'd expect. So um, there were more sort of stereotypic male adjectives used for in the men. There were more sort of stereotypically female adjectives used for the women. Um, there were some structural differences in the letters, too. The uh, women's letters were shorter. Um, they were more likely to have doubt raisers, which were questions like, I don't see any reason why she wouldn't do a good job on the things she did a good job on the things she was asked to do. I don't think her family will affect, you know, some of these sort of things that left doubts. But in terms of um, the terms that are used to evaluate male and female residents, I don't think there's a study showing that if you just use the same terms that you use to evaluate a male resident to evaluate a female resident, it would help her. That's what we don't know. Because since we all share these stereotyped assumptions, you know, just like it probably wouldn't have advantaged Jill to be called extremely aggressive, and it might help Jack, <laughs> we wouldn't want to tell attendings to, to say Jill's extremely aggressive, because we might be actually doing her, it might be counterproductive. So I think there's, a, I'm glad you're studying it. There's certainly a lot of um, interesting research that could come out of that. Great. Let's give Dr. Carnes one more round of applause. Thank you.